Greetings, back again. It's been a while. It's October 2022. It was a nice day earlier, but now it's gotten pretty blustery outside. You can kind of see the wind blowing flag. Today happens to be my grandmother's birthday, and though she is long departed from this earth, as she was actually born in the 19th century, she left me with a story, and I thought I might share that story here with you this evening. So, let's get started. So tonight I figure I want to use this Canson watercolor art board. Now I've used this before, this is 8x10. I have used this before, I've bought, I've had a number of these, and in fact I've already used a sheet out of this. Normally I leave it in the book when I paint on it, but today I think I'm going to, for ease, I think I'm going to just separate this out. So I'm going to remove that, and they pop out just like that. You can see there's a little bit of oil on that one, so I don't know if my paint is going to work very well on it. And so we've got the artboard, and we've got a little bit of time. Now tonight I figure I will draw with my India ink. Now my India ink was getting gloppy. So I have added water to it, and in fact, it seems to be fairly stable. We'll see how, we'll see how it works over time. And let's get started. This story is a story that my grandmother told me just shy of her 98th birthday. She called it, To Pick the Butternut Trees. My grandmother Mary, the youngest of nine children, six boys and three girls, was raised on a farm on the west side of a small town called Glenwood City. On the east side of town, there was a low sloping hill and a dirt road along which grew seven butternut trees. They stood next to a broken down split rail fence, some flimsy collapsing outbuildings and a ramshackle hut. The person responsible for this menagerie of substandard construction was an old man who, as untalented with a hammer and saw, more than made up for his failings with his abilities with pruning and care for fruit trees. Because of the numerous apple orchard in the area, his talents were always highly sought after. The old man loved butternuts and found the best tree specimens growing wild in the forest. He transplanted them to a more advantageous spot along the road next to his farm for them to grow. After years of carefully pruning them, they now stood straight and tall. As the trees grew taller, he cut away the lower branches to discourage the children of the town from climbing up his trees and pilfering his precious butternuts. Late one summer, his sister contacted him from Cincinnati. She hadn't been well and asked if he would come and stay with her. The old man packed up a duffel bag, told his neighbor that he was going to Cincinnati, and left. No one knew for how long he would be gone, but after a year, people began to doubt of his return. Though he only took a handful of items, leaving most of his worldly possessions abandoned in the slumping cabin, he never contacted anybody and seemed to have just disappeared. It was mid-October, 1908, on my grandmother's birthday, when she awoke to the sound of men breaking down a crate after she prepared herself for the day, she went down with her sisters to the country kitchen, which was a building separate from the house, where breakfast and lunch were served for the wage hands and other farmers who would come over to help her father and her five older brothers at their farm. When Mary arrived at the kitchen with her three other siblings, the men had already moved on to the fields. Only her mother and two wives of the wage hands were left in the kitchen cleaning up and preparing to start lunch. The kitchen was a long building with a wood-fired stove with a great iron water tank behind it that was heated by the flue from the firebox of the stove. Next to the stove was an open fireplace with two great swivels to hold large kettles. There was a great long table with a number of benches tucked underneath running the length of the building. It may have been a basic unfinished room, but was cheery and warm in the October morning. After finishing her meal, she saw that her father and another farmer were still in the yard moving parts and breaking down the wooden crate. She went out to see him 
and he explained that at the crack of dawn a freighter arrived from Boardman's Mercantile. With him, he brought their long-awaited, brand-new multi-bladed plow. Everyone got so excited that they cut breakfast short and went out to open the crate and assemble the new plow. They hooked it up to the big steam tractor and were enthusiastically out turning the field. The other farmer in the yard was disassembling the old, well-used plow for spare parts and leaning them against the side of the shed. The men both looked like they wanted to get back to work, so her father smiled and told her to go to town for school. Mary and her two older sisters and her brother, who was still too young to be of help on the farm, went into Glenwood City for school. Because it was harvest season when they arrived at school, there weren't very many other children there, and the older ones that were asked to leave early to help out on their parents' farms. Teachers seeing little benefit in holding the children past lunch let everyone go home early. All the children ran out to enjoy the last of the dry days and the fresh fall air. Mary arrived back at her farm and found her father working in the shed. When she went in, she saw that he had built a strange little wagon. It was made from the bottom of the packing crate with the two hard rubber tired spoked iron wheels in the back and two sprung swivel wheels in the front from the plow that they had assembled earlier in the morning. He said he didn't expect her so early and had planned it for a surprise, but here she was now, so he wished her a happy birthday and told her to hitch up the old mule and go for a ride and enjoy her day. She went and hooked up the old mule, who had once been an important part of working in the fields, but now had grown too old. Now he spent his working time going to town and bringing back supplies with a pack on his back. She wasn't sure if he was going to be very well behaved behind a wagon as he hadn't drawn anything for quite some time, but she hooked him up and they tooled around the yard, making circles around the country kitchen. The ladies inside shut the windows to keep the dust out of their pie crusts, and, at her mother's urging, she collected a couple of children from the wage camp, along with her siblings, and they went to town. Once free of the farm, Mary concocted a brilliant idea, and they set off for Boardman's Mercantile. They needed to fetch her cousin, E. Craig Boardman. Some of the other kids didn't want him to come because he was too small to play any games, being even younger than Mary, but she had an idea, and E. Craig Boardman would play a crucial role, so off to Boardman's they went. When they pulled up to the side door of the mercantile, E. Craig came running out as he had seen them from his second-story window above the mercantile. He marveled at the strange wagon and its ragtag cargo of children as he wished Mary a happy birthday. Mary stepped down from her board seat with a burlap sack filled with straw for a cushion, and they conversed. E. Craig ran inside while the rest of the entourage waited outside. Mary always wondered why he was called E. Craig. Her name was Mary, and there were many other girls also named Mary at her school, so she went by Mary Elizabeth. There was also a Mary Ellen, a Mary Margaret, a Mary Ann, and a few other Marys. But E. Craig used E in front of his middle name, as his father was P. Craig, and his older brother was L. Craig, and she never understood why Edmund didn't simply go by his first name instead of his middle name. His father and older brother also went by their middle names instead of Patrick and his older brother by Lawrence. It's always been a strange question in her mind. Perhaps it was just tradition. Before she got too deep into the thought, E. Craig appeared at the doorway with his father, P. Craig, who had in his hands a number of galvanized pails which he put into the back of the rude wagon, along with a short step ladder. P. Craig said to have a good time, and be sure to be careful with the pails not to dent them, as they'll be harder to sell if they get damaged, and happy birthday. Now the plan was in full force. She snapped the reins, and the old donkey harumphed and began to clickety-clack across town. As they rode through Glenwood City, other children out of school early asked to come as well, and before long, there were over a dozen children skipping and running alongside the strange little wagon as they headed for the east side of town and the butternut trees next to the broken-down split-rail fence. 
The old man had been gone for quite some time now, over a year, and no one certainly expected him to arrive back just in time to weather the winter in Wisconsin, so Mary felt very safe to assume that the butternuts growing in his fine trees were simply up for grabs. Otherwise, the nuts would just go to the squirrels. It is true that E. Craig was the smallest of the children in the group, and many of the other kids didn't particularly like him because he was from the wealthier families in town, but he was light and also known as the best tree climber in the county. When they arrived at the lane, the kids looked up at the tall trees loaded with ripe nuts. How were they ever going to reach them? The tallest boy took the step ladder and placed it at the base of the tree. He climbed to the top of the step ladder and grabbed the tree, with E. Craig climbing up the step ladder and the boy until he got onto his shoulders. Then E. Craig stepped into the older boy's hands. With his feet secure, the older boy pushed E. Craig up until he could grab a low branch and scurry up into the tree. Now, once in the tree, he grabbed a branch in each hand and began jumping up and down and shaking vigorously, causing a maelstrom of butternuts to come thundering out of the green leaves like a Lord Nelson grape-shot broadside. The children immediately grabbed the pails and began filling them with butternuts and then dumping them into the back of the wagon. Some of the boys had pocket knives which they used to start shelling the green hulls off of the nuts. When Mary would move the wagon to the next tree, they would place the nuts underneath the hard rubber tires of the wagon to break the shells. By the time they reached the seventh tree, the shadows were starting to grow long across the dirt road, and the children began to feel that they should get back before they were missed by their parents. Mary snapped the reins and turned the old mule, who once again made a loud huff, but seemed very glad to be heading down the sloping hill and back home. My grandmother said it must have made quite a sight for the people in town as they made their way back from the old man's butternut trees. There were at least a dozen children riding in the wagon, more running alongside, singing songs and cheering as they ate butternuts. Now and then the wagon, having no suspension, would hit a rock or go over a bump, causing butternuts to go spraying up into the air along with perhaps two or three children, who would then scramble to pick up the lost booty and run back to the wagon. It was a glorious day, and my grandmother told me that it was her happiest memory from childhood when she went to pick the butternut trees. When she told me this story, it was her 97th birthday. She was in a rest home because of a stroke and was no longer able to walk. Though her eyes had begun to fail and her hearing was no longer that sharp, her mind was as clear as any time I could have remembered. As she laid in her bed, she told me that she had lived a wonderful long life filled with happy memories, and perhaps there were also some mad memories along the way too, but it's the happy ones that you need to remember because one day, no matter how much money or how many things you may have, there may come a point in life, as in hers, where all you have are your memories. So try to make them good ones. This was the last conversation we would have, as she had another stroke a week later. It was only a few months later, in early 1998, when she passed away, but I'll always be grateful that she was able to share one of her happiest memories of childhood with me. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little story that I've had the pleasure to share with you. And so, until next time. Thanks for watching.